Hey, hey, welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard, an audio podcast. This is, again, one of the early episodes, the um, mainly unedited episodes. Um, and yeah, so today we have a very special guest. He's a very curious human who has lived in Greater Vancouver, BC, Canada his entire life. The exception being extensive international and domestic travel. He has two healthy, honest, hardworking, and committed sons with his former wife who died of cancer over a decade ago. He's fortunate to be in another loving relationship. His work interests lie in people and what motivates them to do things they do. He often finds that people do amazing things in addition to some dumb things, which can be very costly. And his work has been largely focused on how to remediate and minimize the dumb things that we do. We're very lucky to have Al Jones on the show today. Welcome, Al. Thank you very much for inviting me, Tom. My pleasure. Um, so 20 questions for you. You ready? Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, here we go. So number one, tell me a little bit more about yourself. What is it that you do? Well, I, I'm not going to avoid this question, but I'm, I'm going to say there's a more important question for me is who are you actually? Um, what I do is a consequence of who I am, of course. And what I've done in the past is work with people to get them to places that they may not be aware of that are getting in their way. And I like to frame that as saying, I like to free people and free organizations. Um, it's really rewarding for me to do that. Um, and so that's been a, a more current and fairly long-term interest of mine as well, too. That's a great way to start. You know, to preface this, Al and I have just been together studying in an MA course at Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver, um, and we've just uh, kind of completed together, and we uh, we just hung out at Convocation. It was very fun. I agree. It was fun. It was neat to see that really wonderful joy at Convocation, of course. Absolutely. Okay, number two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Well, perhaps in some ways we've just spoken to it. I don't find many people doing the kind of work that I really enjoy doing um, because it's really rewarding when people begin to discover uh, things in themselves that may be holding them back or blinding them because of course we all have blind spots. <clears throat> and. And, and I, I'm going to say that's one of the key differences of, of me. And, I, and, and I'm, as I keep repeating, I'll do so again, I'm sure, but I am a really curious person. So it's only through exploration and people being willing to do a bit of personal exploration that they can uncover some of the things that are getting in the way. So I think that's one of the things that makes me a bit different. Yeah, I mean, that kind of goes in tandem with unique ways, doesn't it? I mean, everybody Absolutely. has their own angle, right? Yeah. And, and what's so fascinating about that is, is we all have our own unique ways really embedded in the culture that we're in, the families that we've been in, the institutions that we've been in. But you know what? We're all human. We're all the same in that sense. Um, and, and it's the difference is created by those elements of culture, growth of a person and so on that really get in the way. Absolutely. I love it. Okay. Number three, why this of all things, for example, in your career, in your life, why do you do what you do? Well, that's a really interesting one. And I, I, that's a really interesting question. What do I do what I do? I think I do it now because it is something that I, I get a lot of joy from. When I started in my career, I started in places like purchasing and distribution and so on, uh, and didn't really know where I wanted to land. I, I moved into kind of classic HR roles, human resources roles and found that uh, that I was different than a lot of people in that particular uh, segment. And so as I, be and as I began to learn more about organizations and, and, and individuals, it change is a really, really um, difficult thing. And it's taken me a long time to understand how challenging change is. And, 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 and when people begin to discover that, it actually creates a bit of an opportunity to think about different ways of doing things. And if I could for a wee moment, I just, I want to point to a, a book, which I found really interesting. By the way, it was during our, our program, by the way, the study of Rome, and we spent some time on that. 
And there was a book called The Clash of Civilizations over an elevator mm -hmm. in Piazza Vittorio. And many people could read that brief book. By the way, it's, uh, it was won a literary award in Italy. Uh, it was written by an Algerian immigrant, interestingly enough. And it is a story of an immigrant experience in Rome and a murder that occurs. And you can read it as a murder mystery. Or you can really think about how troubling it is for all the immigrants in this particular story struggled to um, exist in the context that they were in and what negative consequences occurred as, as a result of that. And it really helped me really understand if people want to make change, I often give this to people, by the way, and say, look, we need to talk about this book when I'm working with them, because I want to understand if they say they want to change, they need to understand how hard it is to change, because it's not simple. And so why do I do all that? Um, because, again, when people begin to crack some of that veneer, um, it can be really rewarding. It can be a bit scary sometimes, but it can be really rewarding. It can help their careers as well and their life. I love that. We just had Dr. Garnett Hertz on the show. And uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, and, uh, and he's embracing change, um, now spending his evenings going to a skate park to do graffiti on the skate park. And he's a, he's a, he's a, I think a tenured professor. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, because we, we fall into a zone of comfort, which is really comfortable for us. And we don't look beyond it. And we're and sometimes not even aware of the fact that we're not looking beyond it. So kudos for that person for taking that kind of an adventure. Okay, number four, and some people find this one a bit difficult, but I'll ask it anyways. What does your future look like? Well, for sure, I know I'm gonna be dead one day. Um, <laughs> that's probably the only thing I can say with a certainty. Oh, and, and I don't know what the future holds. Of course, no one does. Um, but in my optimistic days, I like to think that humanity can come together uh, and that maybe I could be part of it, making that happen in some way. Um, so, so my future is, for me at this point, um, a little bit unclear. I'm not sure. Whenever the topic of future comes up, I talk about Elon Musk and people don't want to talk about Elon Musk, so I won't talk about him today. Um, Good, I would agree. <laughs> number five, let's talk about location. How does the notion of place in, uh, in, in, in brackets, place, play into what you do? Well, so place, that's a, it, it's not necessarily a physical place at all that I existed. Mm -hmm. I existed in a complex milieu of a lot of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so the notion of place for me is, is again fundamentally important to the kind of work I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, it's not what is your place, it's what is your place that somebody's done to create who you are. Um, and look, I live on the West Coast of a beautiful part of Canada and a Canadian culture. Um, so, so place has played a really important uh, role for me. And by the way, physical place has too. Uh, the more I understand uh, about myself uh, and what role place and think in our times as well, too. Um, you know, there's a lot of, and I may get in trouble for this part, but there is a, a, an appropriate a lot of angst about how Indigenous people in Canada have been treated. And it, it is scurrilous the way they've been treated, there's no doubt. And the colonizers that did that, and I'm going to pick the 1860s on purpose because it was pivotal for Canada in its relationship with Indigenous people. The people that exploited Indigenous people did so because in their place, in their context, it was the right thing to do. The Bible gave them the right to see the quote white man as the all powerful, the most important at the cost of many other cultures in many other places, whether it's Asia or Africa or Indigenous people. So that's a long answer to your your question and 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 as a consequence of that i think of all those things when i'm working with people in the broadest sense so i define place very very broadly 
Yeah, place is a funny one, isn't it? I mean, there's place and identity. You know, I'm reading this author, Mark Age, and his book called Non Places about places like oh, interesting. airports and bus stations and movie theaters, these non identity places in uh, opposition to kind of what you're talking about. But, but even those non places, you know, they play a certain role for some people in, in the parts of their lives. It's a uh, I don't know if there are any known places. I'm not sure there is. Absolutely. Um, number six, if you had to start from scratch, what advice would you give your younger former self? This also is a good question. And I think the answer to that was, would be, don't be afraid. And when I say that, I, one of the big regrets I have is that um, I was afraid of mathematics and algebra and calculus and so on. And so I avoided them. And there is such beauty in mathematics that as I see it now, I wish I had the openness to be uh, not intimidated by um, my own internal fears. Um, I guess I could even say that Thomas in terms of, you know, my, my relationship with, uh, with, um, even with women at that stage of life, I just I wish I had more confidence. And of course, sometimes we don't get that until we're a lot older because brains are not fully formed until really even the early 20s, right? Um, so my advice to myself would be, Al, don't be quite so afraid and go do some different things. As I'm starting to do, I think. Maybe this ties in. What's a day in your life like now? Well, it's... Uh, I have the great privilege of spending a lot of time thinking. Um, and, uh, and and I'm really also quite a physical guy. Like I actually like to be quite physically active. So I just was in the gym for an hour and a half this morning. Um, but I think about things like what I call the crushing weight of democracy um, and, and, and the fix we are now in, in terms of democratic process, which is, perhaps run its course in terms of the way it can in, in historical context, because people are using democracy to demand their rights and their quote freedom and forgetting something really fundamentally important, um, which was something actually the French talked about in the revolution, which is fraternity, fraternity of others that I live in and exist in my context with. Um, so when I'm thinking, what is the day in your life? I, I reflect on this thing, thinking, where did it go wrong? How did it go wrong? How could it be corrected? Which is the much, much harder question, of course. The only thing consistent in my day is I go to JJ Bean in the morning. And I, I can't say <laughs> no, no matter what change, no matter like as big changes <laughs> as possible, and still that 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 is the one consistent thing. <laughs> well, I could tell you that my breakfast is exactly the same every day because I make my own muesli. I have my own yogurt and my berries and so on. <laughs> so I have those as well. Okay, here's a good one for you. Lifelong learning is a popular topic these days. How do you stay up to date? Um, <clears throat> lifelong learning, if you want your brain to be active and open, you have to be willing to listen to new and different things. And one has to force themselves to reach outside of their zone of comfort to test some of the things. And so, so for me, of course, it's really popular. How do I stay up to date? Um, essentially, every day, I look at CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, Al Jazeera, Fox, CNN, because I want a broad perspective and I, I, I really am troubled by the narrowing of our knowledge and I'm troubled by the feeds we all receive, which are AI driven, which feed us information we wanna, I supposedly see. Um, so I try to find different ways to find different sources of information. And podcasts are of course a great one. I listen to Anna Marie Tremonte, uh, a former CBC, uh, interviewer interview Malcolm Gladwell the other day. Uh, it was a really cool uh, interview. Uh, he's a really good thinker. So I, I 
I like to search for ways, and again, podcasts are great. Reddit is great. Uh, I haven't used it very much, but I have a real interest in, when I say technology, I mean all technologies, whether it's physics or biology or chemistry or AI or whatever, profoundly important. Uh, but there's so much information. Um, it's a real struggle to, to find the right sources that are credible sources. And you have to be willing to spend some time to dig a little deeper and peel the onion back from whatever you see to try and find what might be the, a truth of some sort. So I would say it's a daily struggle um, to stay up to date, um, but it's something for me is pretty important that I actually work actively at. I love this idea of hitting up the different news sources and hearing the different stories. Al and I have a mutual friend from our MA named Bob, and Bob uh, introduced me to the power of a story. I should really get Bob on here. Yeah, you should. I agree. He's yeah. a powerful storyteller and, and, and a great, in his own way, adventures with all those treks around the world, right? Yeah. Okay. Number nine, and this ties in too, what tools do you use? And the other question is, are you a digital nomad? But that's kind of a weird question for you. That is a weird question for me because I'm not even sure what a digital nomad is. Um, and perhaps you could tell me what it is. Um, are, are you, I think the, the root of that question is, are you primarily digital or are you like a pen and paper person? Uh, well, that's interesting. Um, so I have a propensity to read uh, in nonfiction. So I just finished reading something called Noise, which is about a flaw in human judgment. I'm reading Against the Gods, which is really a story about the history of, of risk and, and so on. And when I read those books, um, and I want them to be in book form, I still have this bad habit. I, I, I note and tick in the sidelines key passages and so on for retention purposes. But for me to use an e-reader, I just, I, I'm, I'm so used to touching and feeling and holding books that uh, I still need to do that. However, of course, I'm on my phone all the time when I'm reaching out to all the news sources and so on that I have to. So in that sense, I, I do certainly use that Reddit too, for that matter. Although I'm, I'm a rather novice at, at Reddit. Um, yeah, so what tools do I use? By the way, I, I also do like really physical work as well too, because <laughs> in one of the places I'm in, I have to split firewood and yak and yaks and work in gardens and all that good stuff. So I think that's the answer for your question. I, I, I use both, but I'm still pretty tied to books. But what's frustrating about them is they're just not current enough. <laughs> Although if you read a book like Against the Gods, which was written in 1996, about the history of risk. It's a really, really good book. It's still quite, quite rewarding, actually. I'm a traditionally trained designer and, uh, and found myself longing for a desk jet bubble jet printer. I don't have one anymore. I haven't <laughs> used one. Oh, right, the original. I, I want to be able to hold it, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm certainly a physical person, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I always bring up this topic of um, of how pen and paper are technology as well, which is another topic. Yeah, that's um, true, isn't it? Yeah. Number 10, how do you deal with work-life balance? I don't have a problem with it at all. I, I, it's not an issue for me in the slightest. I'm, I don't work in the classic sense of work uh, very much anymore. <clears throat> I, uh, I am in a good position, unfortunate position, privileged position. Um, and as I talked earlier, I spent a lot of time thinking and reflecting. Um, I don't feel uh, the stress that um, a lot of people do. And I've been through all that. I know what it's all like, uh, but it's sure nice not to struggle with work-life balance. My partner does, uh, a lot of my friends do, but nice. I don't. I've been, I get like a visceral reaction when the work-life balance is, is not right. So for me, it just, it happens. Like I, it, I'm, I'm forced to balance work and life. Otherwise, like I feel terrible. 
I know that's just me. Uh, well, no, no, no. People, people need to recognize that. In fact, we're having a conversation with friends who are here from Ontario the other day, and this particular chap is like a really driven guy. And the conversation came up about how do you get personal time? He said, "Well, I don't have time for personal time." And when you get into that kind of a trap, where you can't find to make personal time for yourself, regardless almost of your circumstances, whether it's a five minute time in which you, you know, have the privilege of turning everything off and meditating or sitting and relaxing or listening to your favorite music or exploring, exploring some of your reactions to, I wonder why it is I did what I just did and, and kind of explore that. It's so important because if we let work, which I'm going to say is associated with paid work. I think that's inference in this one. Um, we really get caught by it. And, and again, this is a little plea to people. You need to find a way to find personal time for yourself, for sure. It's one of the mistakes I made in, in my earlier days. I, you know, I remember I was taking red eyes to Toronto for business quite often. <laughs> I got pneumonia twice as a consequence of doing that and finally stopped taking red eyes realizing I should probably find a bit more time to chill. But to, yeah. This, uh, this topic reminds me of a professor at Simon Fraser University, Professor Hisun Bai. In her oh, yes. she, uh she works in work-life balance right into the class. I mean, we do meditation, in master's classes, that's very interesting. Um, okay, number 11. If you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? Well, I guess I'd be getting ready for the party we have to go to because we have to take a whole pile of food. <laughs> nice. But I don't think that's your question, is it really? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you could be, I mean, you know, you might want to talk about um, how your privileged situation leads you to 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 have the life that you have. I mean, how does that relate to to what you could be doing? Is there anything that you would rather be doing? I don't know. Oh yeah, I mean, I, like I have had this fantasy uh, to go back to Byron Bay, which is in Australia on the east coast, uh, and to learn how to surf. Byron Bay is a famous place in Australia for surfing. And it's like a beautiful setting in, in, in my mind's eye right now. <laughs> I'm kind of there. And it would be so much fun to just go there and learn how to surf. I mean, I, I could do it here. I, I understand that in Tofino or something, but boy, that would be fun to do because I've never done it. And I, I admire, uh, I admire that. Some of our listeners who, who are probably designers are probably thinking about David Carson right now, who started off as an art director for Surf Magazine. And oh, he was really? A competitive surfer, yeah, yeah. Before yeah. he uh, before he became a, 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 a legendary designer, which is kind of bizarre. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to pull that back to that earlier question you asked me about. I call it fear, okay? And I answered with, you know, I, I my advice to myself with. I wish I was less afraid. And, and, I, and I, when I think back in my career, I think too many times I uh, could have done something that I didn't do. And in hindsight, I can kick myself. Um, but I guess that's part of life. And, 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 and I think it's, it's held me back a little bit. Um, it's held me back a little bit. For other people, it's not a problem at all. They can go jump and skydive and think nothing of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's the linked question for me, by the way. I feel like this next piece you haven't talked about. What would you not like to do, maybe in terms of career or life choices? Well, I, in, in some ways, uh, this is a pretty easy answer. Uh, I, I'm fortunate I don't live in parts of Africa that are struggling with terrible famine uh, and uh, drought. Uh, I sure as heck would not want to be in an authoritarian country like China or Russia, um, and, and for goodness sake, I certainly wouldn't want to be trapped in the wars like Syria, Ukraine, and so on as well too. So I'm absolutely without question 
fortunate not to be in any of those circumstances. Uh, I would not like to be uh, locked into a job that I, I had to stay into. Uh, I, again, you can see behind a lot of that is, is the privilege that I've, I've had, that I recognize that I've had. Um, yeah, I, I also wouldn't want to have to eat kimchi for the rest of my life. It's a Korean dish that's super, super spicy. And, oh, I, I have a Korean daughter-in-law, by the way. <laughs> there you go. There's some weird ones. I, uh, I recently turned down an offer to go to India, and you're making me feel really good about that, actually. It's good. <laughs> Number 13, what's your favorite word, quote, or sentence? So many years ago, um, I read a book, and you may recall this title, A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a, a psychologist who survived Auschwitz and wrote a book after Auschwitz, uh, really about the question of choice and, and when do we have choice? And, and he would argue, and I think I believe this, although I've never been tested in the fashion he was and can't understand it in some ways, was that we always have, in the end, the ability to make a choice about something. <clears throat> And through all his terrible suffering, he had lots of opportunities to make choice. And his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, is, I think, a classic piece that's been reprinted many, many times. So, you know, I, I, I do think about the choices we have, the choices that we make. And I think about him. And when I used to read some quotations from that book to my audiences, you could hear a pin drop. Uh, because people would reflect on that. So I think that would be one of my favorite ones. It's not a direct quote, but it's a reference to a uh, um, man's search for meaning, Victor Frankl. I've said this before, but my neighborhood grocery store is called Choices. Um, number 14, what's your least favorite word, quote, or sentence? Um, I suppose it's, you can do anything. You want to do mm. uh, the, the the mantra of of uh, I don't know what to call that 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 mantra. It's it's a setup for failure for too many people, um, and and I think oversells um, the possibilities of what people can generally achieve. Um, and and I and I want to. <laughs> I, I, well, the next question might be a better answer for uh, what I'm thinking about. Uh, yeah, the next question is a good one for me, I think, too. What keeps you up at night? No, no, we missed one. If you had oh, to pick one word to describe yourself, what would it be? Oh, that one it would be tall. <laughs> <laughs> my partner my partner's I, five foot one. <laughs> I could use it. <laughs> couple notches taller as well um, okay what keeps you up at night what keeps you up at night just so you know i sleep extremely well i can sleep on concrete i can sleep on a bed i can sleep anywhere i don't nice. have a problem with that but i will reflect for a moment on that comment i made uh, earlier mm. um the crushing weight of democracy and and i'm gonna call it unrepentant uh capitalism and the two together have created a really, really toxic mix of income disparity, of ultra rich people. Um, it's really, when you look at the curve, it's, it's pre-depression times were not unlike some of the characteristics we're facing now. Um, I, th I think there's way too much power uh, of money. I think that the voting has been, um, usurped by money and power and, and, and so on. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, that trouble me um, greatly about how we're ever gonna get out of this frantic mess we're creating. And I'm shocked and, and dismayed by a guy like Putin who could make the choice he's made to invade Ukraine um, and create death and destruction when 
humankind is doing a pretty good job of that with climate change already. And now it's even worse than being complicated by those things. So all those things worry me a lot. And I wonder if I've taken enough action myself to try and mitigate some of those things that are happening and going on. Okay, yeah, I think about that a lot. No, uh, okay, final stretch, 17, what's a dream you're chasing? Well, and I guess it's this one. Uh, how could humanity overcome the tyranny of family and tribalism and nationalism in order to activate the kinds of changes that may be required to face the future? You know, if, if climate change continues to unfold the way it is, it doesn't matter whether or not humans cause it anymore. It doesn't matter. The problem is, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, so my dream is, my, my fantasy or my nightmare is, how can humanity collectively overcome those barriers? Mm -hmm. So it's a nightmare actually more than, than, than a dream. Maybe it is a dream too, I don't know. I had that one too the other day. Um, 18, what inspires you? Um, so you noted in the in the bio that my wife died of cancer. She died 13 years ago, by the way. Mm. Um, and she had lung cancer. Uh, she didn't smoke. Uh, we ate organic foods. She exercised. She was highly regarded. She was a professional. <clears throat> and um, in the healthcare system, um, was uninspiring and, and essentially said when she was diagnosed that, well, you know, you got stage four cancer, get ready to die. And she pushed back on that and she lasted three years, which was in those days, pretty miraculous. And one of the things she would often talk about is hope. Um, and this is, I'm sorry, it's a long answer here, but so, so hope for me, is, is fundamentally important. And many years before I had bought her a gold chain. And when she died, I wore that chain for a number of years. And it got to the point that the chain was falling apart. And the jeweler finally said, Al, like, we continue to repair this and it's gonna cost you a fortune or you need to think about something else. And to shorten the story a wee bit, um, I ended up getting an earring melted out of that gold, which is also very weird for me to have an earring. Um, um, and it says hope on it. So I believe hope is fundamentally important. And what inspires me is the hope and the possibilities for the future. That is inspiring. You're giving me tingles. Okay, number 19, <laughs> any advice you'd like to share? Yes, um, I would. I was, I was in the gym this morning overhearing two white guys talking about um, race, essentially. It was only a very wee snippet, and one person said to the other person, and, and you know what? There were no white people there. And I'm thinking, this is so sad that the state of, again, finally, tribalism, nationalism, get in the way of seeing a much grander world. And when you think about, for instance, women not getting the vote until 1919, I think it was, maybe a bit earlier, or indigenous people in Canada not getting the vote until 1960, it was because people couldn't take the time to stop and think about why is it that I feel that way about that sort of thing? What is it in me that's causing me to be like that? And until a lot more people spend some time pausing and thinking, we're all in for a really bad ride. <clears throat> um, so I would ask people to start asking themselves, why do you think that way? Why would you say something like that? If you're in conversation with a friend and they say something that doesn't make sense to you, be curious and say, heck, I, I'm, I, I'm really curious. I don't want, you know, we're friends. I don't want to offend you, but can I ask you a question about that? Um, because we need to explore more of that. Um, we need to explore more of that. 
I like that. Okay, last but not least, um, and you're not a particularly um, self-promotional guy, but how can our listeners keep tabs on you? Well, I guess the short answer, uh, on purpose, I never had a web website for my business. Um, I don't use Facebook. I don't use really very, I, I think I'm on LinkedIn, but like I did that almost by mistake about 10 years ago, I think. Um, so it's actually hard to keep in, uh, track of me. I don't know, maybe they could send you a note if they wanted to, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a fairly private person as well too. So it's a bit hard and I don't know what to say in answer to that. That's perfectly fine. Um, you know, we're very lucky to have you here today to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, I should give a, a shout to uh, to Graduate Liberal Studies at Simon Fraser University. Um, a lot of Alice ideas uh, jive with, with the ideas there. So I think uh, we, we can't not share that. Um, but thank you so much. Um, what a great um, opportunity to hear um, some very current ideas, some ideas around Canada and beyond. Thank you. You're welcome. But I want to make one last plug too. And I want to make a plug for Simon Fraser University's graduate liberal studies program is really, really outstanding and people should go take a look. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Cheers.